Agile for Humans is brought to you by Audible.com. Get one free audiobook and a 30-day free trial at www.audibletrial.com forward slash agile. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player, including Scrum, The Art of Doing Twice the Work in Half the Time by Jeff Sutherland, and Crucial Conversations by Carrie Patterson. Visit www.audibletrial.com forward slash agile to enjoy your free audiobook today. Processes and tools dominate today's agile discussions. But we are devoted to the individuals and interactions that make it work. From the beginner to the veteran practitioner, we have something for you. Welcome to Agile for Humans. All right, we are back. It's another episode of Agile for Humans. I'm your host, Ryan Ripley. Joining me tonight, Alan Holub. Alan, how are you tonight? I'm great. How are you? I'm excellent. I'm really excited you decided to join us. Uh, you have a keynote out there recently on No Estimates that uh, I just found intriguing, and so I've watched that a number of times. and And we've been uh, we've gone back and forth a few times on LinkedIn discussions and seen you out there quite a bit. Just really excited to uh, actually get to talk to you because I we've bounced some ideas back and forth. I, I don't think we've argued. I think we've um, typically gotten along pretty well I think on usually, LinkedIn. Yeah, usually we see to see things in the same way. Yeah, so it's just, it's neat to, uh, in this case, put the voice to the words and to the videos. And so, yeah, really excited we're doing this and uh, really grateful that you, uh, you decided to, to donate some time tonight. Well, sure. My pleasure. So a topic that I see, you know, people get entangled in this. And of course, we'll get into the no estimate stuff, which is a, a minefield of, of awesome and sadness all, all at the <laughs> same time. But, you know, there's this big overriding question or this this more principled question on top of the no, of the no estimates conversation is really around what does it mean to be agile and it's a question that that I struggle to answer sometimes because it is such a big question I'm wondering if you have some thoughts in this area at least at at the outset of our before we jump right into no estimates what does it mean to be agile and how does that impact an organization well as you say it's a big question I'm trying to think the best way to approach this is the the way that I like to think about it is that Agile doesn't really matter. You know, Agile with a capital A and a little trademark next to it is is kind of a wrong way to approach software development. And what's important to me is agility. In other words, what's important to me is the ability to adapt quickly to a changing environment and to adapt as quickly as possible. And then also as a side effect of that, to be able to... um, respond well, not just adequately, but well to customer input. And if you can't do those two things, there's no agility in the organization. So the the problem that I see, of course, is that a lot of people get that wrong, is they think, oh, I'm going to bring in a bunch of scrum trainers, and they're going to teach us about stand-up meetings and, and uh, product owners and scrum masters and that kind of stuff, and poof, we'll be agile. And in fact, I don't really think that process has much to do with it. In other words, a- agile is a state of mind. It means that you're, you understand what the manifesto and the principles are, and you actually try and realize those things. And there are lots and lots and lots of processes that you can use to work within that framework of agility. And to, to my mind, the process doesn't really, doesn't really matter in a sense. It does matter in the sense that you've got to be using processes that make sense for you. But I don't think it matters in, a, in the strict sense. And people have got it wrong, right? They've got it backwards. Is they think that they can adopt these processes and suddenly they're going to be agile. And I think they forget what the word agile means. Is they've got to go look it up in the dictionary and, and try and do that. Try and do what the dictionary says agile means. It means flexible. It means adaptable. It means, you know, all of, all of those kinds of things. It doesn't have to do with rigidly following a framework. Um, a friend of mine, Dan Steinberg, once pointed out, I think really uh, <laughs> amusingly, that if you can certificate something, it's not agile by definition. You can get a certificate in it. It can't possibly be agile, right? Because, oh, no. Right? Because if you can get a certificate, that means there's some rigid definition that has correct answers so that you can take a test and give answers that are either correct or not. So what that means is that what you're doing is following along with this rigid framework. And the whole point of agile is to not be rigid. I, in other words, the, the notions of agile apply to the, to the process as much as they do to the, to the um, software, to developing the software. 
And that seems to be one of the blockers to adopting agility in the enterprise. And what I what I mean by that is, you know, let's say those scrum trainers come in and they hand out those those nifty two day certifications to everybody, and the team starts working with a process. Well, all of a sudden those bottlenecks pop up, right? Uh, marketing isn't responding fast enough. The business users aren't testing fast enough. These right. bottlenecks come up, and suddenly agile failed. Well, right, and it, it, which is a big deal, right? Because agile hasn't failed at all. They've never tried agile, it's right? The, you know, and the 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 thing is, is that you've got to be thinking in terms of, well, again, agility. Agility is a good word. I do a class. I've just put together this this one day class, which I which I really like. If I do say so myself, that I'm just titling agility rather than agile, and I would, I don't want to even bring process into it because the whole point is thinking in an agile way. So, I've been coming up with a bunch of of tests. I've been trying to come up with a bunch of tests of things that you can ask somebody to find out if they're agile or not. So, since I do a lot of training, my acid test is. When you're doing something new and you've got to bring a trainer in and learn how to do it, how long does that take? And in a really agile shop, people understand they need to train training. They give me a call. I've got next Tuesday free, and next Tuesday I'm in there teaching the class. And if it's not an agile class, they've got to get permission from a boss who has to get a sign off from his boss, and then it's got to be I have to be put into their accounting system and around and around and around and around. And if we're lucky, maybe three months later, I'll be able to actually walk on site and give the class. And that's not very agile. And, you know, and that, that, applies, that applies across the board is that all of, the, all of the things that people know and love and assume are the correct ways to make software don't really apply when you're thinking, is it going to slow us down? You know, if you have to ask permission to anybody before you do something, it's going to slow you down. If you don't know enough architecture to be able to make architectural decisions yourself, it's going to slow you down. If, uh, you know, we can all think of a gazillion examples. So the scrum guys, right, they come in and say, well, you can just do this in a bubble. You can do these processes and everything will work. Well, it's not going to work because everything around you is going to be conspiring to slow you down. And one lone scrum master is not going to be able to fight back against that tide. It's just not going to work. So you're, not, you're never going to get any real agility. It's the, or, the organization, in other words, has to be agile, not the, not the teams. Yeah, it does seem like that once that comes first, the team's simpler. Maybe they could have gotten away with it if they had not disconnected extreme programming from Scrum. And, and all I mean there is that at least with excellent, excellent engineering practices, at least you would have seen a bump without too much organizational impact. But with the other processes, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, you are dropping a grenade on the whole organization. And if they're not ready for the changes that IT or a, or a scrum team within IT is trying to drive, it's just a constant headbutting uh, of group against group. And typically the scrum team won't win that. Well, yeah, that's true. But, uh, you know, the real question is why is the business, why does the business want to be agile at all? You know, right. it, it's like if some pointy haired boss heard the word agile at the, at the last pointy haired bosses meeting that he went to and decided that he had to do it because it was cool, it's never going to work. And, you know, <laughs> and the right, right? <laughs> is that yeah. it's, it's ag agile is not a thing. It's a philosophy. It's a way of approaching the whole business. So it impacts the whole business. I think that's an important question. And it's one that's probably not asked enough, because I, I think if you did a poll and of course, I don't have data here. So for the the analytical types, you know, please feel free to light me up on Twitter <laughs> or, or, or in the email. But I would say that a lot of companies are told by a Gartner or a Forrester or one of those uh, magic quadrant based companies that, hey, your portfolio should be agile because profit. You know, whatever they say. <laughs> that's right. right. Yes. But uh, yes. it's it's because right there is no. And now that's there is no and now it's just the thing to do, and and not really thinking about why they would do it. And it's interesting because it's so expensive initially to become or to adopt the agile mindset. It's not a trivial undertaking I, well, at all. I, have, I might argue with that. Is that I think if you're going to do sort of a the nuclear agile option, yeah, but that's so disruptive that I don't think most companies can survive that. You know, you brought up a couple of bottlenecks before, right? The notion of testing. Uh, if you're going to really, if you're going to be agile in the, in the literal sense of the word, in the sense of being able to get it out, get stuff out to the customer as quickly as possible, you can't have a second testing group because if it takes two, you two weeks to make the software and it takes the testers another two weeks to test it, well, it's four weeks before you can get it into the customer's hands and you don't, you don't have that time. So the only way that you can really be agile in the literal sense of the word is to test while you're developing. It's the only option you have, really, because it eliminates that bottleneck. 
So meanwhile, we come back to our hapless company here, and the director of QA is going to be very unhappy when he's told that everyone who works for him is going to be assigned to the engineering teams. So he's going to be working as hard as he possibly can to stop that from happening because his whole fiefdom is disappearing. And that happens throughout the organization. It affects everything. It affects governance practices. It, it, it's, it's a non-trivial thing. And the, the other issue, of course, is that there's all this kind of accepted wisdom about, about the way you should do things. I'm always, I'm always wary when I hear somebody start a sentence with, of course. Well, of course you have to do such and such, right? <laughs> and, yeah. uh, well, come on, dummy. Why aren't yeah. you doing it this way too? <laughs> well, yeah. You know, estimates, right? That's what we're talking about. Is it right, right, on, right in that page, right? Of course we have to do estimates. And then you say, well, explain to me why you have to do estimates. And they say, well, we've got a plan. And uh, then you say, well, what, what does that mean that you've got a plan? And ultimately, if we're talking about a business, what we're talking about is money, right? Is that what you're doing is planning the way that you're spending money. And trying to make sure that you've got enough money to come to some viable outcome for whatever whatever project you're working on, and you don't need estimates for that, you know. In other words, esti estimates are estimates exist because in a waterfall world, it's the only way that you can get a handle on whether the process is flowing properly or not. But agile is so transparent that you don't need that. So, you know, the you don't want to be program you don't not programming, but you don't want to be planning in terms of time at all in an agile world you want to be planning in terms of priority is that if, if you have really short cycles if everything if you're never more than a couple weeks away from having a fully functional program then as long as you're always building the most important thing next then you've always got something good or you or rather you have the best thing that you could have given the amount of time that you've had to work on it and no amount of estimating or anything else surrounding time-based planning is going to change that particular equation you know if anything putting estimates on the scene or putting time on the scene at least is going to slow things down. So you won't get value quite so quickly. So, but that's really fundamental, right? Is that the, the trying to get people to not thinking, think in terms of time when they're doing their planning, it's, it's a really big deal. So that where, where I got started on this, this long digression was, <laughs> was, um, what I like to do, if I, if somebody brings me into a company as a consultant and says, we want to become agile, one of the things that I'd like to do first is to bring Kanban in and wrap it around their waterfall processes. Yep. Right. And that's Kanban has got nothing to do with agile, right? You can wrap Kanban around anything. And the thing that's nice about Kanban is that it sets these nice, um, controls at the gates, right? In other words, you can think of waterfall as a phase gate development process where there's a set of phases you have to go through and there's a set of gateways in the way and, and, um, uh, things flow through the gateways, which are usually bottlenecks of one sort or another. But people don't pay attention to what's happening at those gateways, and Kanban forces you to start paying attention there. So if you put a ready queue in front of the entire engineering department and put six slots in that ready queue in order to limit work in progress, and then engineering says, we'll give you the fastest turnaround time on those six things that you've ever seen. In other words, we're, we're going to reduce our lead times down to almost nothing, which they'll be able to do because you're limiting work in progress so much. But they say enough to go into that those slots and you can't put anything into the slot until something comes out of it and right right so that forces everybody on the other side of that wall to start thinking in terms of priorities and all of a sudden people have got to start uh, communicating with each other and working with each other in ways that they've never had to work with each other before in order to decide what goes into that slot um you know the the you can think out of of it as a as a well, not, not a twelve-step, but a four or five-step program that have to people people go through, where they they start out sort of trying to trick each other and trying to do typical political games, and then they start negotiating, and then they start trying to uh, do presentations and explain why their pet project is better than somebody else's pet project, and eventually, after a while, people will start actually collaborating with each other because that's the most efficient way to get things done. And once that happens, you've got the key element of agile in place and functioning without having to do anything major to the way the organization works, right? So you're thinking about priority-based planning, you're thinking about collaboration, you're thinking about people talking to each other instead of using tools, and all, all of the stuff that's kind of really basic to the Agile principles. And then you can start thinking about process, right? Then you can start thinking, okay, now that we're doing that, let's see what we can do to eliminate some of these bottlenecks, because Kanban will also show you how that bottleneck between between testing, for example, and development is is causing problems and you can start thinking about solving those problems 
which will gradually move the testers into onto the teams. And, you know, over a period of time, you'll be, you'll be, you'll actually become an agile shop. So I don't think it has to be hugely disruptive. It just, in order for that to work though, somebody on top has got to be driving things, right? Is the, this is not something you can do inside the agile, inside the engineering department by bringing in some scrum trainers. Yeah. And it's a pretty interesting tip too. You bring a uh, Kanban around a waterfall practice and, and you, you do a number of things that you mentioned, but most importantly, you, you make the work visible to everyone, Yeah, which in a waterfall project is very easy to bury tasks and durations and costs and those things, all those accounting games and some of the, the Microsoft project uh, depend, dependency games that are uh, so painful to deal with. All of that goes away. The work is right there in front of everybody. The queues are there, uh, the, the roadblocks, the bottlenecks. It's all known and well understood at that point. You start having those real conversations like you mentioned, and then something odd happens in that they start having to define in real terms what value means. So it's, it's no longer the political maneuvering. It's no longer the, uh, my PowerPoint was more compelling than your PowerPoint. We have to have a metric or a means to actually weigh one activity against another and really come up with, in not so fuzzy terms anymore, what value truly means to the organization. It's a really interesting uh, change to watch happen. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. And, you know, and all the, and, you know, getting back to estimates is all that notion of focusing on time starts kind of withering away also because there's no, there's no value in it. Is that in a way, in other words, time, estimate, hitting estimates that have well-defined milestones that you can test is a way of trying to work around all of the politics and all that other junk you were just talking about. You know, in other words, well, and if, you, if you say we have to have X working by March 1st, well, either it's working or it's not. Is there, so <laughs> in a way it's hiding, it's, or rather allowing all of that stuff to be hidden, but it's kind of, it's a way of dealing with the fact that all of the stuff will be hidden. And if you make things transparent, you don't need that anymore is that there are better approaches. Yeah. And I totally agree. And I think it also goes back to theory X of management, right? Yeah. So it's that presupposition that uh, employees are lazy and they must be driven to achieve right. maximum output. Right. <laughs> and, and, and without any trust towards their willingness to do what's best for the, the overall organization. Well, and yeah, but that, with the work visible, those, those feelings can't survive. Right. But, you know, there's so, a whole there's a whole other can of worms. If you thought Twitter Twitter lit up and <laughs> about no estimates, start talking about like all of the stuff that Dan Pink talks about in Drive. Right. Where you you know <laughs> you're actually empowering the employees, which is something you've got to do in a natural shop, right? The teams have to be self organizing and self managing, and self managing really means self managing. You've got to let them make the decisions, and you've got to trust them to make the right decision, and you have to give them the information they need to make the right decision. And that a lot of companies really don't want to do that. Well, and then even worse, you have to give them the cover to make the wrong decision and not kill them. For not it. kill them for it, yeah. So it's incredibly scary stuff to to new teams. And so when we talk about these things, it's I have a lot of empathy for people going through the transformation. I did not, uh, and maybe step back a bit. None of us are born thinking in agile ways, right? Well, maybe Kent Beck was, but uh, most of us aren't. And and so I know I had to learn these these lessons and values and principles, just as I'm sure you did as well, Alan. Well, I, you know, yes and no. Is that if by born you mean learned how to write software? Well, yeah. <laughs> but if by born you actually mean born, right? His kids work in very uh, agile ways, right? They something's important to them and they focus on that and do it. And then when they right. get done with that, they find something else important and they go focus on that and do it. It's a very it's a very natural way to work. And you know, I suppose when you look at a bunch of five year olds on a playground that um, you see all of the stuff that you see inside businesses. You see bullies and you see people who are playing power trips or having power trips but you also see a lot of kind of naturally forming teams where people treat each other as equals and there isn't a, a dysfunctional power dynamic and everybody's playing together and that's the way agile works right there's no yep. it's a very human way of to approach software development and so in a way all of the stuff that we do all that garbage surrounding estimates and all that military junk that came out of the whole sci cmmi stuff um, that's the, that's the artificial thing, right? We had to teach ourselves to do that. And what we have to do is unlearn this artificial thing and go back to a more human way of approaching problem solving, I think. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. The greatest lessons, at least for me as an agilist come from watching my, my three-year-old and my five-year-old play and, and with them playing with their friends as well. It's actually a talk that I've given 
at quite a few conferences, the, the Scrum Master lessons from my sons. And you want to learn what a team, how it should behave and how, uh, how things can get done with a self-organizing team. Watch a group of kids organize a game at the park. They figure it out. They don't need adults and, and other people setting rules and refereeing most of the time. Sometimes it gets out of hand, but they, they really do a great job of just self-organizing and having fun. Well, yeah. But, you know, it's also, looking, it's also interesting to look at what happens with the bullies, right? Because in a way, traditional management that, of course, we have to do kind of management is bullying, right? Is that you've got somebody on top bullying the people under them to do the right job or do the job that they want them to do. And they're pretending that they're not bullying, right? They couch it with all, this, all these buzzwords. But, in fact, when somebody is ordering somebody around, it's bullying, And if you look at a playground, the bullies, sometimes they'll have a clique of people that surround them, but it tends to be kind of a free floating radical on the playground. It's not like they're controlling what's going on at the playground. It's rather they can bully the people that's right in front of them, but they're not affecting the organization as a whole, uh, really at all. And um, the, so the dysfunction is when you give bullies control of the playground, when you turn the bullies into the, into the, into the teachers, into into the playground monitors. (laughs) <laughs> right, <laughs> they can they can cause disruption, but they really can't throw the whole system. They can't off. throw the whole system off if the whole system is agile. You know, and where where right. you where things get screwy is in your typical company where you put the bullies in charge, and at that point nothing works, and it shouldn't be surprising to anybody that nothing works because that's not going to work anywhere else. Why do we think it's going to work inside the you know a business context? Yeah, it, it certainly can do a lot of damage. Uh, fortunately. I've not run into too many bullies at the top, and so I've I've been fortunate in that um, the majority of the management teams I've been exposed to have been benevolent, uh, well, at least in in what they what they attempt yeah, to do. Yeah, they've been benevolent, but the what they're doing, they're not bullies in the sense of somebody who's who's um, evil, right? Somebody who is deli- deliberately trying to play power games, right? But rather, they are bullying in the sense that. They have been taught that this is the way you have to run a business. And I think a lot of them are actually kind of uncomfortable with that. But if they go to Harvard Business School or something, they're taught that's the way they have to do things. So that's the way they do things. And they don't, they don't critique that. They don't, they don't look at what they're doing and try and analyze whether it's a good thing or not. Um, well, I think the, what's interesting is I think it's a generational problem. And so, And what I mean by that is the millennials coming up are just simply not putting up with it. Yeah, no, and, I agree. And that's a really fascinating trend. I think it, I, I think I, it's beyond that, right? As I, my theory is that where it came from was all the way back in the 1940s, right? Is that what happened is an entire generation of 20 and 30 year olds went off and joined the army and fought in World War II. And they came back home and started forming companies. And the only way they knew to run a company was the way the military was run because that's what they had learned when they were in their early 20s. So they set up the, all these companies based on uh, a military model, but it's actually an incorrect kind of military model. If you, if you talk to the generals, in other words, what they'll say is, well, yes, there's a chain of command, but the platoons and the squads have to be agile in the sense that they have to be able to make decisions because there's no time for them to get on the radio and ask questions when they have to make decisions on the battlefield. But from the perspective of the private, you're getting ordered around. So we have all these privates forming companies structuring the company the way they imagine the military is structured. We, right. you know, <laughs> and, yeah, I can see that. Right? And, uh, that uh, and those people were in charge until, you know, what, 1980, maybe, is when sure. things started to change, 1980, 1990. So gradually we're kind of shaking that off, but it's, it's, um, it's a hard problem, right, is the, the getting rid of that whole military mindset. So, yeah, it's generational, but I think it's generational because of what was happening historically when the generation was growing up. Well, and I think, too, if you were to query 100, 100 managers in a room, if you were to ask them, you know, how many of you have had more than, a one, more than one week of training and management? Right. Uh, maybe five hands would go up. Right. But the, see, the real question you want to ask them is, why do we need managers? Right. Right. In other, in other words, the, they don't question the need for managers. That's another one of those, of course we need management, right? Of course we need a manager. And they never, they never question that. So um, it's those underlying assumptions, I think, that are causing the problems. Yeah. So are you, 
before we jump into no estimates mm-hmm. here, which is something you brought up earlier, are you also on the no management uh, path as well? Uh, yeah. Well, I've, I've always believed that with respect to Agile is that I think the teams really have to be autonomous in Dan Pink's sense, right? They've got to, they have to be making their own decisions based on real information. You know, you brought up XP earlier is the, one of the big things about XP and one of the reasons that XP doesn't, can't work in most companies is that you have to have an actual honest to God customer in the room with you when you're doing XP. Is right. that, you know, and the, uh, people lose, lose track of that. It's one of the big failings of Scrum, right? I, I think the PO is just a dumb idea. I really don't like it because it's the, the whole idea of doing things agilely in the XP world is that you don't want to gather a bunch of upfront requirements because they're always wrong. So you've got to be gathering the requirements as you're working, but that doesn't mean that you can't stop talking to the customer. In other words, you, either you're gathering the requirements up front or you're gathering them while you're working, but in both cases, you're gathering them from the same person. So that person better be in the room with you while you're working or you're not going to be able to work very effectively. And to put a surrogate in between the customer and the team is, I think, just a, a disastrous idea. I really hate that notion. Um, you have to actually have somebody who can give you real answers to real questions in the room, not somebody who's going to guess what the real users want, but rather a real user who's going to tell you what the real users really want. So clearly that is an anti-pattern to have a, a proxy or a surrogate. But what about a customer who can actually fulfill that you know, part project manager, part leader, part product manager uh, role? Does that still make sense to you? Well, it can. You know, I've, I've worked in, on a lot of projects where the product that we were building was something that we ourselves wanted to use. So in that sense, everybody on the team was a customer. Sure. You know, and the, the, um, of course it doesn't always go that way, but I, I'm not sure that the customer should be ordering people around. So the, the whole point of agile to my mind, at least one of the points of working in an agile way is that you don't really know what you want until you have something in your hands. So when you let a customer, fill a management kind of role, a manager kind of role, you end up with a situation where they're telling people what to do based on today's notions of how things should work, only to find out that that's not what we wanted, right? So I, 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 don't, I don't think those two things go together. And the, the, but more to the point, I don't think anybody should be ordering anybody around. I, I just really don't like that, is that the, the whole system has to be much more humane than that. Um, which is, you know, that's another big deal, right? Is that people can't imagine that a world in which there are no managers and no performance reviews and nobody telling anybody what to do and nobody telling anybody when things should be done is that all, I think all of that's got to go. And so is this the move more towards holacracy then as far as what you're, what you're advocating? Well, holacracy, Holacracy is a thing, you know. <laughs> it's not yeah. just. It's not just a there, here comes the. Here's the next, <laughs> you that's the next the Twitter storm. <laughs> good, you go onto the Holacracy website, and they've got all their contracts and this yeah. and that and the other. And I, I, I don't know that that's going to work particularly because that doesn't seem particularly agile to me either. Um, on the other hand, I don't think that you need a lot of formal management in order for an organization to be successful. And you know, if you look at. Um, W.L. Gore is what comes up in these conversations a lot because of uh, Gladwell's tipping point. And I've talked to people who work at Gore, and it's all, it's all very agile in the sense that I think is healthy. In other words, the, the whole organization within the building really is self-organizing. As people decide what needs to be done, and they go off and do it. And if they want somebody to be running some piece of the system, they'll, they'll find somebody who can run that piece of the system, and, and that becomes their job. And if they don't, they don't. So... It, it, the formal holacracy thing in a way is a, a means of dealing with people who are not grown up enough to be able to actually do that themselves. They have to have a rigid framework to fall back on. And I don't like that part of it at all. Um, so, but admittedly, holacracy is still quite a stretch even for a modern corporation. Oh, yeah. And then, you know, look at Zappos. Is there, Zappos is struggling with it. Right. Um, yeah, the, the stories coming out, out of Zappos, at least initially, and I think people expect this, or at least they should have expected this, that they would have struggles. Ultimately, I think they'll find their way with some modified form, but to think that that change was going to happen and, and be completely smooth, 
I, I hope no one was, was expecting that. <laughs> I don't think anybody was expecting that. I, including the shareholders. I hope they were ready. I guess it is an Amazon company. So I, I'm hoping the, the shareholders were not expecting that either because it, it's a painful change. But I'll tell you what, if uh, it, it's Tony Haish and uh, Jeff Bezos, if they can figure that out right. and bring that to the, the mothership at, at Amazon. Well, that's uh, a harder sell given Amazon's existing culture, moving it up to Amazon. Sure, but if they figure out the the magic on that side of the equation, they're going to eat everybody's lunch. Oh, I think you're right, absolutely. So that is a challenge, I think, getting to you know the the modern organization, even taking a, a look at hol- holacracy, or being able to say the word holacracy in the hallway without getting thrown out. <laughs> thrown out, right? Probably. But, that's challenge number one. Well, you know, on the on the flip side of that, though, the the shareholders don't care, or they shouldn't. Right. The reason the shareholders don't care at Zappos is that Zappos continues to be profitable. Right. Right. And that's what that's what matters. And the things that are going on inside the organization don't really matter unless it starts impacting profitability. Sure. You know, we lose track it's of this. Fact that this is we're working for businesses sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> it, it is sometimes you do lose that focus, but uh, you know it, it is a fascinating topic. You know, can it, our modern organizations, you know, the, the whole idea of hierarchy, we've talked to Arlo Belshi and Tim Oninger and a few others about this, where hierarchy was initially the best way to get a message across Western Europe back in, uh, back when there were no other means of trans of communication other than word of mouth. Yeah. And so the hierarchy would make people responsible for the messages. And we just brought that, that idea forward into, you know, straight into the industrial revolution, took, um, hand away from head, put processes in place. And it just kept building up and, and just well, stopping to ask the question, does it make sense still to have 10 layers of hierarchy between the lowest person in the organization and the highest? And is that still most effective given all the, the great tools and abilities of the 21st century? I think it's a good question. It's a fun one to ponder. Well, it's one that people aren't asking, though, which, is, which they need sure. to. I think you're right. You know, and it's, it's all tied up with economics, ultimately. Is there's a wonderful book called... Um, Medieval, med- what is it? Medieval Technology and Social Change by uh, Lynn White is the author. It's hyphenated last name. Where he talks about how the stirrup was responsible for the rise of feudalism, which is a really interesting notion, right? Because before the stirrup, people would ride on their horses into battle and then they would get off the horse and fight with each other. And <laughs> <laughs> no, literally, that's what. Wait a minute. That's, Wait a minute. That's what the Roman <laughs> cavalry did, right? They rode into battle and they got off their horses and fought. And. After the stirrup, people could stay mounted, but in order to do that, you had to armor the horse, and you had right. to armor the rider, and that armor was really expensive, and entire economic systems emerged from that, right? The whole idea of you, you need a whole village's worth of economy in order to armor one knight, and the hierarchy comes out of that, in other words, as much as it comes out of anything. So I, I, what I'm getting at here, in other words, is that ultimately we're talking about economic systems. And um, communication is just an aspect of the way that the economic system functions. And you can have, there are other ways to do economies, though, is we don't have to do them in a, in a feudal kind of way. But that's a, that's a hard model to break out of. And, and that will actually blow up Twitter. So we'll probably move away from that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. But you did mention, <laughs> no, I, I encourage the discussion. So if, uh, if the listeners out there, if you have some questions or thoughts, uh, it's at Agile for Humans, at Ryan Ripley. Alan, what is your Twitter I'm handle? at Alan Holub. Great. And so we'll make sure to link all of those in the show notes. Please do reach out because these are fun topics. I think they're important topics. It gets back to the key point. What I would hope that people would pull away from this is that the intent when we discuss topics like this is not to be provocative. The intent is not to be disruptive in a sense. Yeah, the speak, intent speak for really, yourself, Ryan. <laughs> my, well, my, intent, my intent is to be... Uh, focused on humane ways that people can work, and so th- it's a it's a it's an attempt to get safer and, and more. It's really it's to create safe work environments. At least for me, I think we're both after humane treatment of, of knowledge workers. Well, that's the goal. That's my goal. You know, and yep. the, my goal is not just knowledge workers, but everybody. Sure. And the the um, I'm I'm a huge fan of Dan Pink. Is that I think Drive is just a spectacularly good book. I totally agree. And um, I think that's what we have to do everywhere, you know, and we, he's talking about, he's talking about being agile, really, is that all of the kind of core values of face-to-face communication and, 
you know, self, self uh, organizing teams and, and cross disciplinary teams. That's all really a side effect of the sorts of things that he's talking about in drive. And the net effect of that is you do end up with a very humane workplace, but it, it gets, it gets us back to those, um, of course, questions, right? Of course we have to do X. You know, of course we have to limit the amount of paid time you have off because otherwise people would take advantage of it. Well, the fact is, is that when you don't limit time off, people don't take advantage of it. But people won't even do the experiment because they're running up against those assumptions that are incorrect, but there they are. You know, and the, the, the other problem, of course, is the, is the Kruger-Dunning problem, um, which is put in terms of, of incompetence because that was the initial paper. Did you read the initial Kruger, uh, Justin Kruger and I've, David Dunn's paper? I've, I've read about the theory. I've not read the exact paper. Um, I, I think I actually have one on my website someplace. So, uh, uh, let's talk and we can put it into the notes so that people can download it. It's available online. But, um, and also David Dunning has a really good book called Self-Assessment. Um, but that's really what he's talking about is self-assessment, right? And the, this notion that um, the, the mental tools that you need to tell whether you're good at something are exactly the same tools that you need to actually do that thing. Right? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a vicious right? cycle. It's a vicious cycle. So if you're not agile in a way, you don't have the tools to know whether you're agile or not, right? Because you, you, you don't have the competence. So trying to get that process started is tough. And particularly in an environment where people are making lots of assumptions about right and wrong without checking those assumptions out, which is just sort of the natural thing to do in that kind of Kruger-Dunning world. There are so many misguided assumptions about what makes delivery safe, safe and fast. Yeah. And, I, and it's just amazing how many you run into. And the idea, you know, one of them can be 10 layers of management. Well, no, this is how we make sure th the right things get done at the right time and for the right cost. Well, no, wait a minute. That's you're you're causing ten layers of decision making, which means you can't be agile. And then trying to get those messages through, I mean, the the life of a coach must be difficult. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll so, say. <laughs> but you know the but, the whole notion of data driven management, right? Where there there are a couple of guys down at Stanford. Um, what Pfeffer is one of them. My my mind is not working is not working right now. But the the their whole careers have been dedicated to the fact that there are huge numbers of actual studies that prove pretty conclusively that things, certain things don't work and nobody pays any attention to them. It must be a constant source of frustration for those guys. So <laughs> they don't pay attention to the studies and they don't pay attention to the people talking about the studies. So performance bonuses, right? There've been a lot of actual formal studies about how destructive performance bonuses are and that giving out performance bonuses just does damage. There's no good that comes from it. And, but people don't, question that even though the studies are there, even though the data is there, right? And the, the, I don't know, we're talking, we're going in circles here, I guess. It's a, it's a, it's a source of frustration for me, certainly. No, I, I think it's a, if anything, it, it's good to bring these, these ideas to light because it, like you said, these are questions people are not asking or, or discussing. And so, no, I don't see it as circular at all. I, I think these are, you know, if you've not read Drive by Dan Peake, if you don't understand what autonomy, mastery, and purpose, what that does to you and to the people around you, I think you're, you're missing out. You know, this is a, it's a book that really shows you um, how we can raise people up to be the best version of themselves through essentially giving them the liberty to do the right things on their own. And it really is a powerful message. Well, yeah. You know, and I, it's the... As far as I'm concerned, it's the only way to do things. It's the only viable, humane way to do things. Well, I, I think it's going to be the only game in town in the future. And it, it's for the reasons we talked about, that from a generational perspective, people are not going to be pushing these ideas from the other end of the, of the pipe. You, know, you have the millennials who just won't work this way. Right. They refuse. And it's, it, to get back to that point quickly, I, it's wonderful to see some of the change that they're going to force in the workplace. These talented people who will be filling the jobs of, of the baby boomers who are retiring, who did a great job building corporations the best way that they knew how, uh, these, these, bo these millennials are going to come in and they're going to demand a, di a different way to work. Well, maybe. And so, you know, I, I, 
I remember, you know, when I was in high school, I was something of a radical. I guess I still am something of a <laughs> radical. <laughs> but, you know, you're in this, in that ecosystem, um, which we could, we could spell echo either way, right? In that, that ECHO system. Um, right. You, you can't imagine what it's like outside the bubble. I remember what a shock it was when I met somebody who was my own age who was conservative politically. It just, it just didn't occur to me. <laughs> it's okay. It's somebody who was who looked like me, right? <laughs> Didn't think the way that I thought. And um, there are a lot. The world is a big place, right? And we talk about the millennials, but really, the millennials we're talking about really kind of a small strata of upper class, privileged knowledge workers inside the United States and Canada and Europe, right? Right. And uh, the you look at China and. I, it's hard for me to see a millennial force for good impacting the way Chinese companies work. But on the other hand, you look at India and there are a lot of good agile shops in India. So there's a lot of cultural stuff here. In other words, there's some right? ge there's some geopolitical activity that will change as well. I think China, I, I don't want to get too deep into politics. <laughs> I think, I think, I think democracy will unleash uh, China when they finally, it's bound to happen. They will finally move to a democratic system, and I think they will be a a force to be reckoned with. India, you're right. We've influenced that culture so greatly through the the offshore efforts of the 90s and early 2000s, and some of those even continue today, of course, that they could not help but adopt some of our our ideals and and some of the the best practices of you know and best practices is really loaded to. Man, we are going to fire Twitter <laughs> up tonight. Um, <laughs> Let me let me say that they they couldn't help but adopt some of the the ways of working that that they saw uh, over in the U.S. and Canada and Western Europe, and and you're seeing that impact there as well. well yeah, but so. they're taking it further than that. It's not like they're just do, they're just parroting what they're seeing. Is that there are a lot of Indian shops that are good, solid, agile shops in every every sense of that word. Totally and, agree. And if if you it, underestimate them, you're making a mistake. Yeah. And, you know, and that the, they really understand, at least the, few, the shops that I know about, um, really understand what Agile is. And Darwin is going to take over here eventually. It has to. So we brought up no estimates, speaking right. of the radical <laughs> that you are. And uh, I can't believe we've not got into it yet. But uh, this is all, all really good discussion to, to set context for the no estimates discussion. You did a keynote so you got up on stage at Dev Week 2015 in front of a fairly large crowd, I believe, and you told them, we should just stop estimating right now. Yes. <laughs> just stop. <laughs> just, stop just stop estimating <laughs> right now. Nothing good comes and, out of it, yes. That's right. And then shortly following, a, a Twitter firestorm was, was released after that video went online. And, and so, of course, listeners to this podcast know that that myself and most of the other co-hosts and guests, you know, the the various even no no estimates advocates like Woody Zool, Neil Killick, and Vasco Duarte, they've all been on this podcast. We've we're very receptive to that message. What is your version of no estimates, Alan? What do you mean by just stop estimating right now? And what is your alternative uh, when you say stop estimating? Um, well, there are a lot of pieces, a lot of moving parts. Sure. Um, and also, let me say, just uh, before I leap into that, that um, Vasco's new book has finally come out. It was it came out a week or so ago. Yep. So I recommend it highly. Is that I, I read through it the night it came out, and I, I really like it. So um, going the No Estimate book is definitely worth reading. I was speaking to Vasco recently uh -huh. about his book, uh -huh. and it has been wildly successful. Oh, good. So he shared his first um, first week sales numbers uh -huh. uh, on the on the show. Uh, he did it. I think he said he did ten thousand in sales uh, just in that first week. Good. Uh, it is getting a lot of a lot of attention. Wildly successful, far beyond I think what even he expected. And it's not even on Amazon yet. Excellent read. I was a beta reader. I, I've got the uh, the release book as well. Could not recommend it enough. Yeah. You know, and the the um, and the thing about Vasco's book is that it's got bunches of hard numbers in it. Right? It's real data. Right. It's not people waving their arms around saying, oh, gosh, this is going to work. It's saying, well, here's proof. <laughs> and that's important. So anyway, getting back to your question, though, my take on all this all has to do with, well, it's my approach to development generally. Um, 
I'm not a scrum guy, if you haven't figured that out. Uh, <laughs> no, you're not, a, you're not a CSM, Alan? No, I'm not. So the, the, uh, so uh, there are some things, a few more of those, of courses, that you hear from the Agile shop is, well, of course we have to have a sprint, and of course we have a time box, and I don't buy any of that either. So I'm very much a continuous uh, development, continuous delivery kind of guy. Um, I do think that we should be limiting the sizes of things that we're working on, but I think we can be a little relaxed about that. So if a story takes somewhere between an, oh, a week or two to implement, that's fine. And so that's where that all started, right? Is that I started in, in my own work. I didn't bother to estimate with any degree of accuracy how long it was going to take to do a story because it didn't matter. Um, the scrum guys spend a lot of time trying to shoehorn work into a arbitrary deadline. In other words, the end of the, the end of the sprint is an arbitrary deadline. So they're trying to pick exactly the right mix of stories that will make it so that they can finish work on five o'clock on Friday and go home and everything will be done. And that's an impossible task because you can't really do it. And I looked at that and it just seemed like a really, really wasteful process to me. Both, in other words, the time spent doing the estimating seemed to me to be wasteful. And the process itself was wasteful in the sense that you would take low priority stuff and move it into the sprint just because there was room and you would maybe start padding out the sprint a little bit. There are a bunch of really dysfunctional scrum shops that's, that say, oh, we've committed to a certain number of points and we have to earn those points or bad things will happen, which is like just such a major dysfunction. I can't, I don't even want to start on that one, but, um, that's all about hitting estimates again. Right. And I see that as a very destructive kind of force. It forces people to start thinking about working overtime and just all of the stuff that flies in the face that everything in the face of everything that's agile. So I haven't been estimating my own work in the time based sense in a long time is that my the, the way I have worked for years now has been priority based in terms of my planning. So the the um, I'm always working on the most important thing next. And I try and make sure that the thing that I'm working on is no more than a couple of couple weeks work. And when I get done with whatever I'm working on, the system is ready to deploy and I go grab the next most important thing and start working on that. And I've never had a customer object to that is that they, they like the fact that what they have in their hands is always the most valuable thing. And, um, so that's where it started. And then as I was working with that, I, people started asking me the kind of natural questions, which are, uh, so when are we going to release, <laughs> right? <laughs> if we are running a business here. We do need to know things like that. So I learned about Kanban and, um, things like, uh, cumulative flow diagrams, which I think are spectacularly useful tools. So the notion of a, so the, given something like a cumulative flow diagram, then you can figure out where you're going to be at some point in the future by looking at actual measured progress in the now and in the past. So you don't need to estimate in order to make projections using a, using something like a cumulative flow diagram. So that kind of pulled me out of the whole estimation process um, by, by using those two tools, by having a continuous delivery system and, and using cumulative flow. Uh, one of the things that Vasco did that um, I, I understood intuitively, but I hadn't seen the actual numbers was uh, comparing a cumulative flow diagram made with story point estimates with a cumulative flow diagram made by just counting stories. What a, what a brilliant yeah. and in, what a what a question to ask. I I wish I would have asked him uh, how he thought to do that yeah. because it what an insight. Well, you know, it's if you think about it for a moment. The and I, I've thought about this because people keep asking me how can this work. Um, a cumulative flow diagram, every column of it is a whole stack of stories, right? There might be, on a big project, there might be 50 stories in the stack, right? right? And if you think about it, if, you, if, if the individual atomic units of those stacks, the individual stories, were all estimated using story points, then every little square that's stacked up on top of every other little square is going to be a slightly different height. On the other hand, if you take the average length of a story in points and just resize all those little squares so that they're an average height, the height of the column doesn't change at all, right? So by thinking in terms of averages, the need for doing some kind of a story point estimate just disappears because every story on the stack 
has the same estimate. It's the average amount of time that it takes to do a story. So at that point, you can just count stories because, because the points don't matter anymore. Yeah, and that's uh, that's one that it took me a little while to wrap my head around, but eventually it made sense, especially with the help of Vasco's data. He does lay that out very well in the book, and it becomes very clear reading it that, yeah, counting stories uh, is a very valid way to go. I think Neil Killick also supports it. He explains it through the a mechanism uh, that he calls a slicing heuristic, but it's really a similar thing where a team working together long enough will slice in a similar way. The stories will end up being a similar size that you don't even have to ta- you don't even have to label it anymore. It's just how that team works, right. and it, it is a powerful change because at that point the, the discussion is focused on value. You're no longer oh this is an eight. No, it's a three. Well, right. why do you think it's a three? And you know. How much time is lost there? Instead, it's, well, we think it can generate this much revenue. It can, it can mitigate this new regulation. It can, you know, you're having these far more interesting conversations about what you're delivering rather than some arbitrary planning poker number that, that may or may not help you. Right. Well, I can't, you know, the other side of that, of course, is that upfront estimates don't work, right? They never have, right? right? And in a way, Agile is a response to that. But it doesn't work any better at the Scrum sprint level <laughs> than it does at the project level, right? It doesn't work. So I, I right? understand, I understand why they want to do it. And so I, I get the idea that, you know, Scrum is trying to, uh, through process limit whip. And so that's it, not necessarily a bad end. It's just the means that I think we disagree with. Yeah, But just limiting whip is not enough, right? Is that the, it's, it's necessary, but right. if by limiting whip, you end up you know, if we're going to go to a manufacturing analogy, you've got to make the right parts in the right order or you can't do the next assembly. Yeah, there certainly is thought that has to go into more than just, you know, limiting whip is, is necessary but, but not sufficient. Right. So I, I, I would agree with that. I, so I'm still, my brain is still locked in that Scrum is good, at least for new teams. And I, and I think it gets them on the on-ramp, able to handle Kanban, but you now have me thinking about wrapping Kanban around a waterfall project and slowly moving away from estimates. Yeah. You know, cause the, if you start doing that, things just kind of become agile, right? That's the thing that's nice about Kanban is that when you start eliminating bottlenecks and stuff, all of a sudden the teams start becoming agile teams without having to push for it. And it's because right. everybody understands why at that point, right? There's no, you must do this for some reason. And that's, that's why I, that's, I used to think what you just said, which is to say that scrum is a good way for a, to do baby steps, right? A way to get started. But more and more, I've gone into companies where they do Scrum and they treat the Scrum Guide as some kind of gospel. And, you know, in the most dysfunctional places, they they even go to the level of saying, if it's not in the Scrum Guide, we can't do it. Wow. <laughs> Which is really awful. But they they say, you know, I hear people say things like, oh, Agile says that we should do X. And that's, of course, complete nonsense. Is the There is no Agile to be saying anything. Agile is an adjective. It's not a noun. But the, the, um, it gets people thinking in the wrong ways, right? As they start thinking in terms of process. And well, I find it interesting, too, that the Scrum Guide is not explicit about estimation. No, I, so I don't it, actually blame Ken for this at all. <laughs> you know, well, he tries really I, I hard to was, make the Scrum Guide actually be a loose framework, but people just well, don't get I, it. I think he was right to leave it out. Yeah. And so no estimates can work on a, on a Scrum team. Yeah, absolutely. I, I truly believe that. But... Um, Back to this talk. So right. it did set off some, first of all, uh, the talk is excellent. So it's a note estimates keynote from Dev Week 2015. We went on this tangent, so I'll, remember, I'll remind everyone what we were talking about. A uh, link to it will be in the show notes. I'll probably have an embedded video as well. It's an important watch. It's 37 minutes of why you shouldn't estimate in a traditional sense. So one of the arguments that I've seen, Alan, is that forecasting is just a a looser estimate. And for those people that want to make that argument, you win, stop listening, go away. <laughs> well, yeah, you know, you can define the word I'm, to mean anything you want. Exactly. Um, when, it, when I, when I use the word estimate, I'm trying to, what I'm saying is that you're, you're doing some kind of upfront front planning. That's trying to predict a time at which you'll be done. Right. And r- really the, see the thing about, I think the people who say that the thing that they don't understand about a cumulative flow diagram is that, it's always changing, right? Constantly on an hourly basis, maybe. 
So the point of a cumulative flow diagram is not to predict when you're going to be done. It's rather to be able to understand when you have to start playing with scope. So it's really all about value again, right? It's all about deciding what are the most valuable things that we have to do so that we can be sure that we've got those done at a particular time in the future. And the cumulative flow diagram then is giving you a tool for um, doing the reevaluation of the scoping rather than predicting the future. And uh, am, I, am I making sense here? Is, in other words, it, yeah. you know, it's not a, it's not a predictive tool. It's not, the, the strength of it is not its predictive nature. It's the strength of it is that it's a tool for seeing how what we're doing now is going to play out over the next few weeks. Well, it helps you visualize the whole, which is what I really appreciate about the practice, right? So you can see where the new work is. You can see the overall size of, of your backlog or the stack of stories that you have. You can measure WIP. Uh, you can measure what's remaining to be done. Uh, you've got your cycle time, but you can also see bottlenecks. You can see where where stories are accumulating. Right. And suddenly you can see not only do we have X amount of work left to do and not enough time, but we have this bottleneck that if we solve, we could possibly do better. And that, to me, it just makes more sense that you're looking at the work in that, in that kind of frame or lens rather than just a date and a cost. You know, you get so much more value off of knowing your lead time, your cycle time, and your bottlenecks. And at the same time, you're limiting WIP, which means you're actually going to end up getting more work done. That's right. And if, if you don't understand that, hang with us. <laughs> it, it will start to make sense well, as you start doing it. You know, there, there are resources there, too. Is um, Goldratt's yeah. book, The Goal, is a spectacularly yep. useful book, right? Is that if you, if, we want, if you really want to learn why Kanban works and what Lean is really about at its core, is the whole theory of constraints thing. It really is at the center of everything. And it's a, it's a nice, you know, it's an easy read. It's written like a novel. But it's, um, it's, it's, it's another sort of essential read, I think. I, everybody should read it. Yeah, I, I think between uh, Daniel Pink's book and Vasco's new No Estimates book and uh, Goldratt's uh, The Goal, uh, I think you get the whole picture of the kind of world that, that we envision. Yeah, I think you're right. So, Alan, at this point, uh, as we come up against our time box uh, for this podcast – I usually ask the the guest if there's anything they've got going on that they'd like to plug, any recommendations for the listeners, anything that uh, you would you think they should know about. Well, in in terms of plugging, um, I do I am putting together a couple of new classes which I'm pretty happy with. So, if you want to go onto my website and take a look at them, um, that would be a good thing. I'm happy to come in and teach them in house. Um, I'm doing one in particular that's just a one-day class on agility. I brought that one up earlier, but I really like this class because it's not focused on process. It's focused on the cultural side of agile and what you need to really become agile. And it brings in process as you move through the class, but it does it in the context of the culture. In other words, when you do these cultural things, you te these, ten these processes tend to emerge. So I think that's useful. Um, the other class that I'm teaching that I'd like to plug is a, is a agile architecture class that I'm using or putting together now, which I'm, I'm not actually using the word agile in the name of the class because agile is getting a bad, <laughs> a bad rap in some, <laughs> in some <laughs> sense. So I'm calling it designing for volatility, which is about how do you come up with an architecture for a system that can stand up to the stress of being changed all the time. And the, the, uh, the thing, one of the things that people often don't talk about when they talk about Agile is you can have the most Agile process in the world, but if the architecture of the software isn't up to it, you're not really going to be able to be Agile. At least you're not going to be able to make changes fast enough to really pull it off. So that's what this other class is dealing with, is how to come up with an architecture that makes it possible to make changes inside the system as it grows to a pretty large size. And so, Alan, really grateful that you, uh, you gave us an hour to talk. I think... Uh, a lot of good value will come out of this. If anything, if people start arguing with us on Twitter, at least there's a good discussion around uh, some of the things that we can typically take for granted. So really want to thank you again for, for joining me tonight. For the rest of you, of you out there, as always, I'm your host, Ryan Ripley. The Twitter comments this week have been excellent. You guys are, are so gracious with your, your feedback and, and your praise. Can't thank you enough. It's incredibly humbling to see the download numbers and all of your feedback continue to grow. And just really pleased that you're here and thankful that you're listening. So thank you for all of that, everyone, and have a great night. 
Thanks for listening to Agile for Humans. Let's keep the conversation going. Drop us a question on Twitter at Agile for Humans or visit agileforhumans.com.